when things are closed, you see that there's a lack of trust. You see that also closed is often as a result of the need for control. You need to control the users. You need to control the data. You need to control and centralize information. And so that to me was never exciting. You know, it was just reliving and digging deeper into more and more corporate models that don't serve society, don't serve humanity, don't serve any form of justice. Hello and welcome to Inspiring Open, candid conversations with influential women whose careers and open ethos have pushed the boundaries of what it means to build community and succeed as a collective. I am Betty Kamkambwedu, a journalist and women's rights advocate. Join me as I explore the fascinating backstories behind Africa's most tenacious female personalities. Inspiring Open is a podcast series from Wiki Loves Women, a project of Wiki in Africa. Be inspired, be challenged, be bold. My guest today is Esra al Shafi, a Bahraini human rights activist. As a teenager, Esra saw a migrant being mistreated and she knew she had to do something about it. Since then, she has spent her entire life building digital platforms that amplify underreported and marginalized voices in the Middle East and North Africa. Her work includes Mid-East Tunes, a web and mobile application for independent musicians in the MENA region who use music as a tool for social justice advocacy. There is also ahua.org, a discussion tool for Arab LGBTQ plus youth, which leverages game mechanics to protect and engage its community. And migrantrights.org, the primary resource on the plight of migrant workers in the Gulf region. Esra has shown sheer bravery and resilience when it comes to promoting human rights, and we are honored to have her on Inspiring Open today. Let's get right into it. What misconceptions do people have about the Gulf countries that you would want to set straight? When people think about the Gulf, oftentimes they think about unearned wealth. And of course, there's some of that, but the majority of the people in the Gulf work very hard. Um, and they it's just a place where it's very community oriented as well. It's not as materialistic as people make it out to be. When people think of the Gulf, oftentimes it's only Dubai. I mean, it's not even Abu Dhabi, other parts of the UAE, let alone other countries um, in the Gulf. Or it is Saudi Arabia where everything is completely oppressive and youth don't have a creative spirit where a lot of them do risk a lot of what they have in order to have a a creative outlet, whether it's through film or through music. We have a very healthy and vibrant um, independent scene for young creators. So I think of the Gulf as a very creative and spirited place. What did you study in school? And did you always know you wanted to be in the tech space, let alone the activism space? In school, I studied political science. Um, I always was excited at learning about international relations, politics, policies, what, why we are in the position we are. And of course, studying this what had its own biases, depending on what books you were forced to read, what essays you were forced to write. So I didn't like that part of it. I didn't like the restrictiveness of academia. And that's actually how I got excited and interested about technology because it was limitless. I chose what information I wanted um, to look for rather than be given a specific assignment to be told, this is the opinion you should have. And these are the books um, you need to be uh, learning from. And they have to be approved by the Ministry of Education, for example. So in that sense, sometimes education is in this, within the same line as propaganda, you're being taught what leadership, wherever you are, want you to be exposed to, um, and you really can't question much. So when I started using the internet in my early teens, it was at a school library. And again, we were told what to search for and to write a report about that. And at the time, we we're using Ask Jeeves, you know, some of the older search engines to look for this information and then to create 
a GeoCities website so that we have a grasp on how to create some of this, um, how to publish some of this content and make it accessible to other people in our school, but actually was making it accessible to everybody in the world. And that wasn't emphasized. But quickly, I learned that I could send this to somebody all the way in China, all the way in Belarus or wherever, and they would get the same information. They would look at the same website that I was looking at. And to me, that was really empowering. Um, and that's how I started really dabbling with um, building platforms. I started, of course, GeoCities, you know, some of the um, more traditional um website creators at the time that were very limiting, eventually more and more Drupal, Joomla, and then finally WordPress was the where I ended because that just opened a completely different framework for how limitless and how endless, but also how accessible it was to be a creator without really needing to have IT or computer sciences there as your background, because a lot of it could be self-taught. If I didn't have a plugin for something, I would either go to um, a YouTube page and learn how I could develop one. Um, if it was something a bit more involved, I would obtain the support of the WordPress community forum where people were very supportive and responsive. And that really just opened up the avenue for me to connect on a much deeper level where I started creating these platforms to invite different opinions and perspectives and thoughts because I was never interested in just having a blog or a website only for me to express to the world my opinion. I was actually more interested in learning what others thought because I felt at the time I didn't know much. So who am I to go there and just express myself without it being informed? Because I knew that what I was reading was propaganda. I knew it had to be questioned. I didn't know how, and I didn't know where to look for those alternatives. And that's really what the web represented to me was that limitless opportunity for endless learning, um, as well as very powerful collaboration, especially with marginalized communities, we were not encouraged to have a connection to, whether they're um, uh, communities like the Kurdish community, for example, the Baha'i minority in a lot of Muslim-majority countries that were severely persecuted. Um, we were just told to listen to these stories, forget them, or just deny their existence altogether because it's their fault not conforming to the norms or for being different, that they deserved to be punished. So I really wanted um, to learn from them rather than read about them from mainstream media and, and just have that be my only outlet of information. So I started creating these platforms, um, Baha'iRights.org, for example, KurdishRights.org, you know, and so on and so forth. And each website would invite Kurdish writers, Baha'i writers, and the idea is that they, these are members of our communities who have been silenced, censored, surveilled, punished, merely for being different. So I wanted to be sure that they had the outlet that they needed and that they could also feel that sense of empowerment without necessarily having to also learn to be a creator, as long as they knew how to you know, sustain the platform. So that for me was very important, was to make sure that the platforms that we create aren't being just for us, but it's also for others to be able to take, to iterate, to expand upon, um, and for their stories to be accessible. Since you're talking about platforms, let's continue with the ones that you've built, particularly the ones under Majal. Um, let's start with Migrant Rights. You started Migrant Rights because as a child, you witnessed the abuse of a migrant, right? Yeah, that um, that really also is what started my journey into self-discovery as well, because I was nine years old where I really started opening my eyes to the injustices that we were surrounded with. And that's very unfortunate, and it happens throughout the Gulf, that migrant workers are treated like less than um, the uh, a Gulf citizen or a global North expat. They were um, abused in many ways. They were um, the stigma of them speaking out was always unacceptable. There were no avenues for them to fight for their rights. Um, so what ends up happening is that 
they become literally enslaved in our society. And that slavery actually becomes completely legalized and normalized. That there's a sense of ownership of an employer that can abuse them um, with and, and completely escaping accountability for that. Be, merely because of who that individual is, where they're from, and the nature of their work, such as domestic worker or construction worker or even a farmer. And when I started speaking up about this in school, I was told this is not the place for it. At home, I was told you have to be careful because this can be can put you in trouble. Um, anywhere you go in society, people really rejected that notion that this is your problem to fix. Let the government figure it out. Let the workers figure it out or let the sending countries um, that these workers belong to get involved and figure it out. This is not our problem. But it was because our infrastructure was being built off our backs. They were building our homes. They were building our schools, our hospitals, our uh, roads. Um, so without them, we economically, financially, I mean, just in many different ways, we wouldn't be where we are today. And so a lot of what you see in places like Dubai or Abu Dhabi or um, Doha or even Manama, um, a lot of these places, they were able to flourish often as a result of this type of exploitation. So of course, they will be seen as these places that are investing, but at the same time, it's because they are either severely underpaying, abusing, overworking, or sometimes not paying a lot of workers their due wages. When massive towers were being built in, in um, throughout the UAE, a lot of during these periods, a lot of migrant workers were also committing suicide. They were also denied legal aid, denied health care, denied even the right to go home because they were given their visas would expire and their employer wouldn't take care of that. And sometimes they would have to um, choose between homelessness and despair wow. or imprisonment. Some, some of them can't even afford to be deported because they would be forced to pay that fee. So they can't even go home and be reunited with their family, even if it would be at a financial loss. Some people lose their lives and their families don't even know about it because their bodies are just discarded as if it's nothing, as if that person's life doesn't matter. So I felt every time I would walk into a place, a park, a school, I would have that guilt that I'm complicit. For that reason, that's where, where really I turned to the internet as one of those mediums that I could use to expose and document these rights abuses. So the MigrantRights.org platform was founded in 2010. And ever since, it's been um, collecting and curating and documenting information. But now we have also expanded to connecting migrant workers with on the ground resources for relief, support, um, urgent care and whatnot. So that's something that really emboldens for me the power and impact of online collaboration and networking, because doing this at the scale that we are really required us to build those on the ground connections in each of those Gulf countries, which was not going to be possible. I was not going to travel to Saudi Arabia and advertise that I'm looking for advocates because that would put me at risk. I would be deported. I would be banned from other GCC countries. Um, I would be worse imprisoned. So I had to be super cautious about how I go about doing this while protecting myself, while protecting my team, which is why I'm also physically anonymous on the web. That's one of the things that I do in order for me to protect myself, to protect my family, so that when I'm out, out and about in Bahrain, I'm not immediately targeted as this individual who is doing all of this controversial work. You know, Ezra, even as you talk, I can just sense the passion in your voice and the way you articulate this. I believe tackling this migrant issue was not easy because it sounds like it's a system that people are benefiting from it. What mm -hmm. would you say are some of the challenges you have faced in trying to be the voice and be the support that you can be for migrants? Censorship was a major one because when we started, my advocacy was angry. And I realized quite quickly that that backfired. It was not in favor of the migrant workers because people would just dismiss it as that's just angry advocacy. Of course, you are enraged with a lot of what's happening. But when you express that anger 
and you put it that this is beyond expressing that this is unacceptable. Oftentimes, the way that I was formulating things, even alongside my team, the way we strategize about things was just mere exposure, no solutions. And people didn't want that because it just gave them a burden. How do they just want to sit there and read about one ex- abuse after the other? It's depressing. They don't They don't want it. So we had very low traffic. We had very low engagement. People didn't want to participate. And worse, the government was blocking our websites, which meant that we couldn't reach the people that we wanted to reach, including the migrant workers oftentimes who would want to reach out for support. Um, for this reason, we started re-strategizing and exploring ways that we could be more collaborative um, with and more diplomatic in our approach to this issue and started also involving a lot of young advocates in university, usually freshmen um, who are just starting out and they really want to get involved, but they also don't want to get in trouble. We felt that people were avoiding us because they were scared, not because they didn't care about the issue. It's not as if nobody cared. So many people cared, but there was that sense of helplessness is I care, but how do I help and what do I do? Um, and we weren't giving that outlet. We were just telling them what the problem was and um, which serves the purpose of documenting the information, but it doesn't serve the purpose of change when you actually want to have turn that information into legitimate advocacy that is resulting in direct impact. And that requires time. It requires persistence. It requires iteration. So I learned the hard way that these things were not as overnight as oftentimes you hear about, that somebody goes out in a protest and later some minister resigns. These things do happen, but it's rare when it's something this um, systemic, because this is not a single individual that was causing this issue. It was social. It was baked into how society at large functions, how our economy functions, and it had implications for people financially, culturally, and so on. So the root of the cause was very deep and we had to dig and dig. And that really required us to have that level of patience and to have that diplomacy that allowed us to involve a lot of people in this conversation that wouldn't really consider themselves to be activists. They were students, they were professors, they were actually even people working at the Ministry of Labor who themselves would come to us sometimes and say, this is a problem, we agree, you know, and here are some policies that we are hoping to put in place and enforce. And of course, you take these things with a grain of salt because you have to see what is the government doing legitimately um, and, and genuinely to actually resolve this issue and what are they doing um, merely for the sake of PR so that they could have those, you know, World Cups and host all of these uh, events without having that relationship with we are also abusers of migrant workers. You see all the time, for example, things being built, whether it's universities being expanded or the Guggenheim Museum having a chapter in Abu Dhabi and artists completely refusing to even showcase their work there because they say, first, you have to pay the workers that actually built this um, you know, museum. So these are the kinds of things that we had to really explore in many different directions, how to do advocacy and how to do it differently in every single country. And instead of me as a Bahraini woman advocating for migrant workers in Kuwait, we have Kuwaitis themselves coming up and setting up you know, events and um, trainings and um, collaborations. And all of this was happening both online and offline. And that marriage is very important. So that then became also more risky for us, though, because it meant that people were being targeted. And we did have writers, for example, who participated in our website, in research, people that we've worked with for many years who started disappearing, who started um, being tortured, who started being threatened, who got deported and never allowed to return. So that really enabled us to also pick our battles wisely because we don't want to put other people in danger. We also need to protect the movement so that not everything that we do is met with immediate censorship and surveillance and abuse. Um, And as a result, we have gotten uncensored now from various websites because we feel that our tone now is a lot more appropriate and more importantly, fact-based. I think about maybe seven, six years ago here in Ghana, 
the feminist movement online became very, very strong. And mm-hmm. then a lot of people, including myself, thought that the, the tone was so angry and so like vile that, like you said, people would want to get involved, but they are just unsure that is this the right movement to join because these people are too angry. And I, I understand that when you are starting out, of course, when you see the issue, sometimes your initial reaction is anger. But Mm -hmm. for some people, they are not able to review the work they've done, the kind of results they've had, and to adapt and change and and find what really works better. And I think um, that's something that a lot of movements are not able to do. So they get stuck with the anger and they don't get the support they need. They don't get the results they want. And then they get frustrated and then they die out. Completely. Yeah, I would completely agree with that. When I read about Ahua, I was like, you are a risk taker. And I like that you could build a platform where people in the LGBTQ plus community can have a spa- a safe space to connect with people who are like them, who think like them, who feel like them, to share and to build each other up. And again, this is a topic that is not openly discussed where you come from. Yeah, and this is also one of the hardest initiatives I've ever had to do because of the sensitivities involved. And it's for that reason that it was one of the, it's the, it's the platform that came last. When I was building a, lot, building a lot of these platforms, you know, it was migrant rights, it was dealing with marginalized communities in other settings, whether it's religious or ethnic minorities, for example. But here it was, very challenging because this was a literal life and death situation also for a lot of the people and it required complete and utter anonymity and how do you build a platform that embraces anonymity without it being turned into a troll factory so that was something that was very difficult because we wanted to build a place that had that sense of intimacy that sense of community at the same time without really knowing who you are. Um, So how we went about that, when we built the platform, we started very small. It was just a couple of hundred of users and we just tested a wide range of features and we saw where where were the trolls um, frequenting? Were there many trolls? If so, how do we go about making sure that this was going to be an accessible and welcoming space that people really felt invited to share very deep stories, meaningful stories about how they deal with their identity and reconcile that with their faith, with their society, with their culture, with their upbringing. And people sometimes go as deep as, you know, wanting to be talked out of suicidal thoughts. So there were a lot of wide range of issues. And there were some people there that also wanted to go and talk about music and films and just fun things. So, It was really started to be a platform where many different things were being covered, but all of that required caution. And we wanted to be sure that we were protecting people. And it's not something that we guarantee. It's not something any platform could ever guarantee. No matter how many encryption tools you're using, how many encrypted messaging tools, even if you're using Signal tomorrow, you know, something happens, your your device gets um taken physically, sometimes not everybody is wiping their messages as they go along. So, I mean, nobody's 100% secure, no matter what tools you're using. And if you tell users that you will be fully secure, then they will have that false sense of security, which is even more dangerous. But one thing that really made this platform work and in a more sustainable way was the fact that it relied on a point system. And the point system really enables you every time you share a story that other people find helpful, anytime you um, engage in a supportive way by supporting somebody there that may be needing help and that person says this person was helpful, you gain more points. And based on the number of points you get, you can unlock different um, sections of the site. So the chat room is only accessible to people with a certain number of points. Um, We have a, a restricted area for resources. If you want to access resources, that is only possible with people with a number of points. And that really enabled us to limit the trolling because then the trolls, in order to gain access to these more intimate areas, 
they would have to be very supportive and tolerant. Um, and a lot of people who want to troll the LGBTQ plus community would never want to put themselves in a position to say something kind, only to be able to say something negative. So they end up leaving because it's not worth their time and they don't want to say anything positive. Um, and this, re- this enabled us to run this platform without really needing a lot of moderators, without needing a lot of resources, just to have things be, you know, moderated all the time. Um, uh, you know, you, we still have a flagging system. It's not perfect. So there are things that happen sometimes and you people have to flag them. Maybe somebody shared their mobile number or their full name and they were, you know, they didn't realize that it wasn't in a private message. So, of course, it's not perfect or bulletproof. Um, but it did help significantly. Now we have over 11,000 users and very, very little trolling, for example. I love all the platforms you, you've built and particularly the ones that we've spoken about. But my favorite so far is Mid-East Tunes because I love, love music. It initially was for underground musicians. It was to give a voice, to amplify, I, I guess, the voices of underground musicians. Why the choice of underground musicians? Well, first of all, I was always also in love with music. And I felt music was such a powerful and creative way for young people in particular to learn about other communities and to also express our creativity to the rest of the world. And that's part that connects to what I said in the beginning, that when people think about the Gulf or the region at large, um, they don't think of creativity and music. Um, th- they think of, you know, other things that are very s- stereotypical based on how we are portrayed often in media, um, whether it's written or in films and so on. And I started really learning about, for example, the Kurdish community and their their struggle through the eyes and voices of Kurdish hip hop artists. And even though you don't speak the language, you can hear the pain, you can hear the the hope, sometimes the optimism, but sometimes you really can really uh, hear the the pain in their stories. And I felt that that was really what invited me to learn more about what I can do, you know, to, to be a part of those types of movements and to really see how was I being complicit as a member of society that was also preventing them, you know, from having a voice and for denying our role of when, you know, in when historically oppressing them um, and displacing them territorially. So when I was looking for more music because people said, oh, if you like this artist, you will like this artist. And if you like this artist, you can check out this genre as well. And I realized that each of them lived in a very different place. One of them would be in a Drupal website, one of them would be on MySpace, one of them would be, you know, on just very different platforms and none of them were connected. So it made it very difficult for me to really keep track of who was releasing new music and um, who was really, uh, how artists were even connecting with one another because sometimes you'd collaborate with an artist and you'd realize that they didn't know that there was also another artist that was doing something similar. And that's really where the idea of Midi Stones was born. And when it first started, it started only for underground musicians in the Gulf because I felt that those were being punished a lot of the time. You see a metal band in the newspaper and it would be told, the devil reaches Bahrain. <laughs> you know, it was very negative, um, very discouraging, very demotivating. And I wanted to be sure that we could build something that could support and help this community thrive. And so I worked with a few, and it was actually the the platform became possible as a result of a local Bahraini band called Smoldering and Forgotten. And they were one of the first bands that would sing heavy metal and black metal and classical Arabic, which was very unique. And this molding of different cultures that I thought was just very interesting and also very underappreciated and underrepresented online. So I built MIDI students to bring these voices together. And when I built it, you know, it stayed up for about three weeks. And, you know, I realized, well, maybe new artists want to join themselves rather than me finding them and curating it on my own. So we created a join button. And the next day we had 40 artists, one after that, 80, 100. So the 
interest was very overwhelming. People wanted to join and be a part of the platform. Um, they wanted to be discovered, but they also wanted to discover other artists. So it just started expanding. And now from just underground, we look at what qualifies as just independent, any independent artist, political or not, who felt that they didn't have a home in another platform would have a home in Midi Students. Give or take, of course, the fact that they're not sharing racist or sexist content, for example. Um, but for the most part, for um, when it we have Apple Music, Deezer, and Rami, which is the local Spotify alternative, um, none of them are able to function without complying legally. And complying legally means getting rid of any artist that has a social or political implication, getting rid of any music that would mention minorities or marginalized communities or the LGBTQ plus community and so on. So that's really something um, that excited me about Midi Students is that we finally have a place that we can explore the independent music scene without the lens of corporations, without the lens of government censorship and propaganda. So it's the most exciting thing we worked on, but it's also by far the most, one of the most challenging um, after Ahua. I, I just hope that like with the many things that you, you've done in the past and kept it going, you know, you find ways and means to keep Mideast tunes going. Because I, I think as you've identified, it's really, really needed in the culture. Yeah. And one of the things we have actually even started to do is just earned income. We use our own income to keep it up and running because due to that lack of funding, um, it's not sustainable, but I would rather do that than shut it down. We get a lot of artists who reach out to us and say that this platform has really been significant for them to the point where we had a, um, a hip hop duo in Gaza and in, in, in Palestine come to us and basically say, we don't have much. We don't even have clean water. But if we create an album, we will give you the majority of the sales if it meant that you could stay up and running. Those are the types of things that make you realize that that's how much meaning it has to some of those artists. We also started collaborations with studios. One of them is the uh, Underground Producers Alliance in New York. And every year they would pick um, an artist from Midi Students who would have a scholarship to receive remote production training. The fact that they could share their expertise with our artists is really, it, it has been just a very treasured uh, experience for us. We also started collaborating with, for example, the um, Universal Hip Hop Museum in Brooklyn, and they wanted to feature some artists from the platform as well to also help bury the stigma that you can't be, you know, a hip hop artist from the region and not also be violent or not also be um, a regime loyalist, for example. So it, it really helps give that type of awareness to others that, you know, that these cultures can also, um, it gets people excited to just learn more about cultures they would usually completely avoid. It's so exciting to see the impact and the change that the work you've committed your life and your security to do is having. I'm so excited. I'm so excited for the future of Midi's Tunes. So will I be right to say that now you've put all the platforms you create under this Majal uh, umbrella? And what does Majal mean? So uh, it means in Arabic it me and Persian, actually, um, creating an opportunity or creating a way um, we also got excited about the name um, because it was one of the few last remaining five letter domain names, <laughs> you know, so it was um, very easy to understand, just majal.org. So um, we decided that, you know, we create a lot of different platforms. We have many different efforts that are happening simultaneously, and we wanted this to be the umbrella organization or entity where all of these things can live under so that we're not running completely separate platforms, but really everything falls within one umbrella. Also because it made sense for us to do this legally in a very cost efficient way. Um, so that's really why uh, why we did that. And this, this process, it happened in 2015 where we kind of rebranded and started putting things under one umbrella rather than running things in a very 
uh, in a silo, basically, because also the team was starting to be very disconnected from one another and we were losing expertise as a result. Um, and this just, Mejal just made sense for everything to kind of come together. Some investors or funders don't believe that people from the global south, for instance, can build tech platforms. And so sometimes funding becomes a challenge. Why is that so? This part is uh, definitely something that's difficult for me to contain my anger. So I know that I always try to keep my advocacy not angry. Unfortunately, this is one that I'm very angry about because there's a huge lack of trust. There's racial bias. There's sexist bias. Um, it's, and when it comes to women from the global south or members of the LGBTQ plus community from the global south, building these um, platforms, we have no avenues. And that actually is why um, I participated in the founding of the Namoon Fund, which specifically funds tech from the global uh, south and from the larger world that is often ignored by corporate funders, by private foundations, and just by the normal players in philanthropy. Um, I mean, I think I don't have a reason for why that is because I feel that we have proved very much our capabilities for many years. And sometimes even 10 years, you're building something and you are trying to raise even as little as $10,000, which in the context of these types of platforms is not much. Um, you see um, a small civil society organization that just popped up in San Francisco or in DC and immediately they get $25 million to do something that is not as widespread or international or needed. And it's very wasteful, but it's also very, there's, there's no, it's not equitable, it's not accessible, and it's nowhere near fair the way that uh, philanthropy today functions. Um, oftentimes they say, well, we, you don't have a proven track record. We do. They say, oh, it's because of sanctions and legal. First, there's no sanctions against any countries in the Gulf. Um, and then unless it's amongst one another, for example, um, you know, Qatar, Bahrain, and so on due to these interpersonal relationships. But again, sending money to Gulf-based nonprofits, nothing wrong with that. Um, so, but to bypass that, because we kept hearing that excuse over and over again, we actually set up an organization in the Netherlands which made us more global northy in the sense that our legal um, registration is there. But because we are based in the region and because we are from the region, that was not enough for them. So we realized that this was more than just a legal restriction. This was a perceptional restriction that they couldn't trust or believe that we were capable or that they actually sometimes it would be more sinister. In some cases, it wasn't just due to lack of awareness. In some cases, it was due to the fact that I would, I genuinely believe that some funders don't want to put that power in our hands. They want to maintain that power because it keeps them powerful. Yeah. And, and you, you start realizing that once you start attending those conferences and events, and every time you want to do something that you think could be empowering, um, your community, they would shut it down and they would do something that would be self-empowering and self-serving, that they would be enriching only themselves that somebody in a nonprofit who are executive director of a very small organization is getting $200,000 a year just as a salary. And here you have major operations running at $100,000 a year with a team of 10 full-timers and you have server costs and legal costs and tax implications and all kinds of uh, obstacles. So I, this is something that is, is never has sat well with me. I've been very vocal about this. And as a result, I have compromised funding because of that. There are some funders that don't like to be shunned in this way. And there are some funders that today I refuse to work with because I see that that has been their attitude in how they approach Global South organizations. We have just been very punished for being who we are. And it's just ironic because philanthropy is supposed to be there to in service of uh, social justice, not to even add on to the obstacles that prevent you from pursuing it. You tweeted that asking grantees to undergo an intrusive terror check 
depending on where the founders are from, shouldn't be normalized protocol. Either do it for everyone or do it for none. I assume this is in reference to funding and access to funding. Do you mind elaborating on this? And what is TerraCheck? So we have, as grantees, been asked to to undergo it ourselves as founders. And for every single contractor that we work with, whether they're a developer or a part-time researcher, they have made us request that they sign uh, documents that say that they not only didn't participate in terrorist activities, but sometimes they would, based on where they're from, whether it's Saudi Arabia or Egypt or Libya, they would have to undergo a terror check of some kind, which is basically a background check to make sure that their finances have never been funneled to militant groups or terrorist groups and so on. And we noticed that, okay, sure, you know, when you start a bank account and whatnot, you will have to undergo that type of background check. Now, somebody in DC or New York or Berlin or London creating a nonprofit and requesting funding, never have they been given that. Maybe some white person in London is also funding a terrorist uh, organization. Maybe it's a white supremacist organization. Why aren't they also being asked to sign these? Because we would ask. We would ask other grantees. Is this something that you have done? No. We would ask the grantee, uh, the, the funders, we, how come it's only us? And they would say, oh, you know, that's just uh, uh, w- the banking system that we use based on where, because of where you're, you're based, you know, this is something that we have to do. And it's also something our legal department has requested that we do as an extra precaution. Why would they say that extra precaution? You know, that we, that they have to be wary that maybe we have some terrorist ties because we are also, you know, in the Gulf and that maybe that there's a lot of money fun- being funneled to ISIS and whatnot. So there's, there's that. And the thing is that if you want to do it, do it. That If that's your policy, that's your policy. But don't make it racial based. Don't make it geographic based. That If you're here, this is what you have to do. Um, and if this is something that legally you're required to do, find a way to make that process less intrusive, less humiliating and less dehumanizing. We have always been treated extremely differently because of where we are, who we are and also who we serve. They say you can get the funding, get rid of the Syrian and Kurdish artists, for example, or get rid of the Saudi artists or get rid of any artists that, you know, uh, have LGBTQ plus content. Wow. We're not going to do that. But funding is not what it is made to be in the sense that a lot of them want to just be. We have to sit there and just congratulate them or we have to sit there and play their games about this nitpicking approach about who gets support and who doesn't. This is interesting. And. I'm happy you're taking this stance because at some point somebody needs to take a stance against injustice. And this clearly is injustice. It's an absolute injustice, um, which is always ironic because it's an injustice in an attempt to pursue (laughs) justice, you know, Um, that you're trying to do things to prevent this type of marginalization. And um, at the end, you get met with the same type of discrimination you would expect from oppressive regimes, really. Right. Activism in all shapes and forms is not easy. Being a woman leading this charge makes it even more difficult. And for you, the region you come from, the MENA region, even adds another layer of difficulty. How do you cope as a person, you know, dealing with this? Because this must be so tasking on the mind. You know, for over a decade, I completely took my mental health for granted. And it's only recently that I, shortly actually before the pandemic even, that I really started realizing that I was showing a lot of signs of burnout, of depression, demotivation, lack of passion for some of what I do as a result of those obstacles. Because 80% of it became just bypassing one legal or financial challenge after the other. And only 20% was actually creative output, the things that I really, really enjoy doing the collaborations that I want to build, the partnerships I want to build. Um, A lot of it was just day-to-day managing also the stress levels of my own team because when we have legal struggles, it implicates them. When we have financial struggles, it implicates them. It has always been an uphill battle. What really kept me grounded was just sometimes is you need to know when to walk away, when to take a break, when to say no to um, a travel request, 
I've spent many years saying yes to everything that came my way because I thought this is so important for marketing visibility. We need the funding. You know, we need to uh, uh, for we need to have uh, brand recognition. None of that matters at the end of the day. You go and you pour your heart out, and often the only thing that people get out of it is funding for their events, not funding for you. So people would hear your story. And if they get inspired, then they would fund, for example, Access Now and RightsCon. They don't think of you as, let's fund this organization directly. So I started realizing that a lot of those networking opportunities were not really healthy. They're not healthy in general, because a lot of the time people go there and it's sometimes the work is not very serious. You know, they go there just to network, get to know one another, um, get funding from large organizations to do very little. And I just realized that that, if anything, it only added resentment rather than just genuine need for it, you know, this type of collaboration, especially that a lot of collaborations resulted in exploitation. We would end up doing the majority of the work and some large organization in the global north would take credit and take the funding and walk away. And I just realized that it wasn't worth it. Why would I put myself through that? And I was putting myself through that so much because I felt it gave me credibility to continue um, this work. And at some point, you have to think that that's not how it should be. I didn't want to normalize that this is what a Global South founder has to do and what they have to put themselves in a position to, to be exploited only to have that level of um, validation. You don't need that validation. Our work speaks for itself. The existence that we've had, the uphill battles speaks for itself. Users, they would speak for themselves, what they have to say about our platforms for the most part, our team. We've been oftentimes working with exact same people for more than 12 years. Um, that's what keeps me going, is being reminded of what's important and why you started this. Um, and I also took a lot, a big step back from social media, um, from from many different things um, when I felt like it wasn't useful for my perspective to be had. I, I didn't feel like I needed to keep up with this rat race. Today, it's, some people think if I don't tweet five, 10 times a day, I will not be relevant. I really don't want to subscribe to that type of mentality. I don't owe it to anybody to share anything, you know, exactly. and um, I just started respecting myself without needing somebody else to respect me first. And I think that took me very long time. Um, since starting this work, I was 16 years old. I only re realized it much later. You know, I'm now um, 34 and it's actually 35. <laughs> so yeah, I'm already, um, <laughs> but even as a, as it took, when I really started dealing with this, it was, I was at 33. So I spent that long figuring myself out and also taking the time to um, slow down. I'm glad that you've mentioned that the validation is really in the work that you are doing and how the people you're trying to support are attesting to the fact that this work is really needed and is, ch is changing their lives. You don't need a big corporation from the global north, like you've mentioned, to come and tell you that you're doing great, you're doing this, you're doing that. But you you also mentioned the beauty of open. Tell me more about that. I mean, everything we've done has been rooted in open. Everything that I've ever built has been through um, accessibility of an open framework. And that just made things very it made it that you can also be a creator and not just a consumer. And for me, that's really the beauty of open um, in many different shapes and forms. It's just having a, an, an open framework, an open platform, an open philosophy to everything that you do celebrates that diversity and that collaborative spirit that um, really gets highlighted in, in the in the type of platforms um, that you see today. When things are closed you see that there's a lack of trust. You see that also closed is often as a result of the need for control. You need to control the users. You need to control the data. You need to control and centralize information. And so that to me was never exciting. You know, it was just reliving and, and, and digging deeper into more and more uh, corporate models that don't serve society, don't serve humanity, don't serve any form of justice. Open, I think, has just been such a big gift. Indeed, open is a gift uh, that keeps giving. 
and mm-hmm. we're, <laughs> we're glad. We're, we're very, very happy for that. What keeps you going? There's mm-hmm. no easy part to what you do. What is it that keeps you going despite all these difficulties and challenges? Really good friendships. People who've been in my position who have also are trying to go th- through the same obstacles. They have been my support system because you know you're not alone. Um, but we all know that we are going through challenges and we make room for one another. It's just been a very joyful experience sometimes just stepping in to the people that have supported you for a very long time and being able to also give back in that way. Um, the other thing is very, very tremendous colleagues. I mean, I would be nowhere without my team. My team have just been incredibly loyal, persistent. Um, they've been very empathetic to everything that we've been going through and supporting one another as a result. I've interacted with feminists, activists, women who are doing everything to ensure that fellow women are empowered. Some of the notion, and I don't know why people think like this because there are, there are thousand and one examples of women who are strong, who, who are um, pursuing a social change and making it happen. And they have, they have love in their lives. I mean, is that something that you've experienced? And uh, what would you want to say to people who think or who have this kind of notion? Well, especially um, that people would say we wouldn't have time for love or for that type of personal relationship and whatnot. Um, in the very beginning, I was also of that belief that I, I'm i here for a bigger purpose. I'm not interested in anything like this. Or, um, But it really does you more than love. It's also just a unique partnership that is trustworthy, respectable and something that also can keep you going that when you when you're down they pick you up when they're down you pick them up it's that sort of give and take but it starts with respect um and it's really just about finding the right person at the right time um sometimes you find the right person at the wrong time um so it it takes something that really is requires a lot of evolving of you as a person, of you as a founder, as a creator, as whatever it is that you do in your in your professional life, and finding a way to also um, extend that to the personal. The nature of my work makes me a very difficult person to be with because it's a lot of stress. It's a lot of energy that gets thrown into something beyond a relationship. It's about work. And for me, I have always been very upfront that I'm my my work really does take precedent over many different things. And that's slowly changing, but I'm not quite there yet. So am I the perfect partner? No, um, but I feel lucky that um, I'm being tolerated. <laughs> <laughs> it feels great to be tolerated. <laughs> it really is, yeah. <laughs> when somebody describes and says, hey, how is your partner? And they say, well, you know, not bad, not bad. <laughs> Anyway, so what future do you want for the the Gulf countries? A future that doesn't punish differences, whether it's differences of identity, of opinion, uh, of religion, um, of social status. Right now, it's a very classist and racist um, society, speaking just for the Gulf and even more specifically for Bahrain, um, something that's a lot more open. We see no censorship, no surveillance. Um, We do away with all of this type of repressive policies and abusive systems um, that punish people, um, again, you know, simply for who they are. And one that embraces knowledge, one that makes knowledge accessible, equitable, um, where diversity isn't something that is threatening. Um, The ideal life is that the platforms that I'm building today would not be needed at all. I love it. I love this. I do wish you all the best. I'm happy that you get to enjoy life despite the risky nature of the work you do. I'm so happy you, you took this decision to, you know, not put your face out there so you can enjoy your life. I just hope that we we're not living in a world that requires such an extreme measure. But I hope it's not, yeah. 
it is what it is and you make do with what you are given. So yeah, once again, thank you so much. It's such an honor uh, talking to you and I've really, really enjoyed every bit of it. You too. Thank you so much. Ezra al Shafi is a human rights activist. And Ezra, we do appreciate all the sacrifices you have made so others can have a voice and a safe space to be themselves. We don't take it for granted. Thank you for listening to Inspiring Open, a podcast series from Wiki Loves Women. This first series of Inspiring Open was funded through the International Relief Fund for Organizations in Culture and Education 2021, an initiative of the German Federal Foreign Office, the Gothi Institute and other partners and an annual grant from the Wikimedia Foundation. If you enjoyed today's show, subscribe on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you listen to your podcasts so you never miss an episode. Feel free to share, rate, and review us. We appreciate the support. You can also tag us in your posts. We are at Women on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. I'll leave you with the words of Ntozake Shange. Sisterhood is important because we are all we have to stand on. We have to stand near and by each other, pray for one another, and share the joys and the difficulties that women face in the world today. If we don't talk about it amongst ourselves, then we are made silent by the patriarchy, and that serves us no purpose. Until next time, look after yourselves and your sisters. And remember, be inspired, be challenged, be bold. I am Betty Kankambwedu, and you've been listening to Wiki Loves Women, Inspiring Open.